about the doctrine of assurance uh, yesterday. We were talking about, first of all, justification, which we said was the forgiveness of those sins that are past. Then we were discussing regeneration, the new birth, and we talked about the liberty uh, of the gospel uh, in terms of freedom from the power and dominion of sin, and we explored that. Uh, and then uh, we were exploring, considering the marks of the new birth in terms of faith, especially faith that delivers. And then we were talking about the second theological virtue, which is hope. And we talked about hope specifically in terms of the doctrine of assurance. And we said that the doctrine of assurance, two witnesses, two witnesses. First of all, the witness of the Holy Spirit with our spirit that we're a child of God. And then secondly, the witness of our spirit that we're a child of God, the indirect witness when we appeal to such things as conscience, the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, obeying Christ, obeying the commands of Christ, that, that sort of thing. Uh, and so I want to pick up um, <clears throat> and, and say a few more things about Wesley's doctrine of assurance because this is one area in his theology uh, where he made uh, a number of changes, a number of changes. Um, and the first thing I should say here this morning about assurance is that Wesley referred to the direct witness as the common privilege of a child of God. A common privilege of a child of God. Um, in 1725, um, I want to quote a couple of things that Wesley said on this topic. He wrote, but I am persuaded we may know if we are now in a state of salvation. In other words, God doesn't leave us in the dark. We can know. We can know if we are a child of God. Since that is expressly promised in Holy Scripture to our sincere endeavors. Then, later, in 1738, Wesley had this to write, quote, I want that faith which none can have without knowing that he hath it. Okay? Uh, and so we see here the emphasis on assurance that we know that we are a child of God. Okay? Uh, and then, of course, you're already familiar with the Aldersgate narrative because we talked about that in detail. And remember that language, that language of May 24th, 1738. Wesley wrote, quote, I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Okay. Um, now, later on in life, Wesley reflected back upon some of his earlier practices and early misunderstandings. Okay. Because what he was essentially teaching and telling people that if you don't have the direct witness of the Holy Spirit, uh, you, you're a child of the devil, you're, you know, uh, and that is not proper teaching. And so I'm going to quote to you uh, a letter, part of a letter that Wesley writes to Melville Horn on this issue when Wesley had, was confused in his thinking here. Uh, and made some mistakes and obviously caused some people some pain. So listen to this language. Wesley is very honest. He's, make, you know, he's admitting he's at fault. Here's what he writes. Quote, when 
Now, this is, this is probably 1588 or so, 1588, Wesley's writing this. Uh, excuse me, it's eight, 17, 17, 1788. It's late in uh, Wesley's uh, career. I'm, I'm, I've got part of my mind in the Reformation. I've got part of my mind in the 16th century. Um, yeah, this is 1788, late in Wesley's career. He's writing um, a letter to Melville Horn, and this is what he writes, quote, when 50 years ago, so in other words, going back, you know, to 1738 or... Uh, when 50 years ago, my brother Charles and I, in the simplicity of our hearts, told the good people of England that unless they knew their sins were forgiven, they were under the wrath and curse of God. I marvel, Melville, that they did not stone us. <laughs> the Methodists, I hope, know better now. We preach assurance as we always did, as a common privilege of the children of God, but we do not enforce it under the pain of damnation, denounced on all who enjoy it not. Okay. So what Wesley is saying here, early on in his career, he was essentially saying to people, well, you know, if you don't have the assurance that you're a child of God, you're you're under the curse of God, you're under the wrath of God, and that doesn't follow. That simply does not follow. Uh, because Wesley came to realize that you could be justified, truly justified, and born of God, and lack the direct witness of the Holy Spirit. You could, uh, in certain circumstances, okay? So, on the one hand, he still wants to say it is the common privilege. It's not the rare privilege of the children of God. Some Anglicans might have thought, uh, because of their fear of fanaticism, they might have thought that the direct witness was a rare privilege. Wesley is pushing back against that teaching and saying it's the common privilege of a child of God. But he is not saying, if you do not have the witness of the Spirit, you are a child of wrath under the curse of God. Why? Because you could be justified, born of God, and not have the direct witness because of what? Well, because of ignorance. You don't realize that this is a gospel promise, that this is promised to you in Scripture. It's promised, as we said earlier, in Romans. Uh, or you may have bodily disorder. You know, you may, we talk about brain chemistry today. We talk about clinical depression. We talk about a number of ways that the body interfaces with the soul. Wesley takes that into account. Uh, we may have bodily disorder, which will prevent us from the recognition of the, the assurance of the direct witness in our lives. Uh, and so Wesley corrected that erroneous teaching that he once taught, unless you have the direct witness of the Holy Spirit, uh, you are under the wrath and curse of God. That is confusion. That is improper, improper teaching. Okay. Um, there was a letter that uh, John Wesley wrote to his brother Charles uh, in 1747, and he writes this, uh, but I cannot allow that justifying faith is such an assurance or necessarily connected therewith because if justifying faith necessarily implies such an explicit assurance of pardon, then everyone who has it not is under the wrath and curse of God. And so in that uh, quotation, Wesley is essentially saying the same thing, uh, although what he is doing, if you caught it, he is um, distinguishing the grace of justification itself uh, from the issue of assurance, okay? And what does the grace of justification bring? Uh, it brings confidence, it does, to be justified, uh, to be free from the guilt of sin, to experience that grace brings confidence. One is confident 
uh, in terms of approaching God. Uh, one, uh, uh, you know, but assurance, the direct witness, is yet another thing different from that confidence. Do you understand the point? Okay. Uh, it's just another way of saying what Wesley has said earlier, okay? Uh, he's making uh, some clarifications and some corrections here. But continually uh, throughout his career, certainly after 1738 forward, uh, Wesley uh, underscores that the direct witness of the Holy Spirit even though he's made some of these corrections, is the common privilege of a child of God. Uh, and he wanted to underscore that, okay? Uh, so you can see uh, we've spent a lot of time on the second mark of the new birth, which is hope. We've talked a lot about assurance uh, because you can see here in Wesley's theology, he had to make some changes because he was confused in his understanding and in his teaching, okay? Now, what's the third mark of the new birth? What's the third? Love. love, that's right, love. Uh, and in light of your comments the other day, uh, Wesley is going to see love or holy love. I think it's better to say holy love. Um, and I was actually uh, talking to Mark Nelson. Uh, I'm going to send him when I go home I, I have identified a dozen, you know, like 12 instances in Wesley's writings where he specifically refers to holy love, holy love. Why is this important? Why am I emphasizing this? Because there's the danger of misunderstanding. Because if I talk about love, I'm going to stand up for this. Look at this. I've got to, I've got to stand up for this. If I talk about love in a 21st century context, people are going to fill in the content of that word with all sorts of things. I mean, we even use this in American commercials. Oh, I love my carpet. You know, I love this. I love that. When some people use the word love, they mean lust. That's what they mean. Uh, when some people use the word love, they mean Self-love, they mean it's me, the I, the me, the mind, the self, and the like. Or when other people use love, uh, they mean uh, the privileged groups of which they are a part, you see, and they're talking about their privileged groups. Um, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about those things at all, not at all. So we need greater clarity. We need greater clarity. And so what does that mean? That means, and Wesley was careful here, dozen times, dozen times. So there's no misunderstanding. It's holy love. And when lots of people, even in the church, when they talk about love, they don't mean holiness. They don't mean holiness. They don't. They mean something else. They mean, oh, whatever, whatever these groups want, whatever makes you happy, you see, that's what love is. Love is indulgence. Oh, and God is so good. God is so good that God indulges us in our ongoing sin. No, that's not God. That's not God because God ever wills the good. Ever. God cannot but will the good. And that good for us, you already know, holiness and happiness. Holiness and happiness go hand in hand. And God wills for us happiness true happiness, real happiness, the kind that will last. And that can only last if we become holy, okay? So when we talk about love, what we're immediately going to say, we're talking about holy love. Now, where is the best expression of holy love uh, in our story, in our grand gospel story? Where is the best expression of holy love in our Gospel story. Yes, yes, precisely. It is at Golgotha. It is at Calvary. The humble, sacrificial love of Jesus Christ surrendering himself, offering himself up as a sacrifice, giving his all for us. Uh, that's what we mean by holy love. 
We don't mean what self-absorbed groups mean, saying me, 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 me. They're just doing it on a group level. They are as selfish as individuals. They're just doing it on a group level. Me, 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 I'm the center. No, you're not. Jesus Christ is the center. Calvary is the center. Golgotha is the center. In that very dark place where there is torture and mocking and shame, we see the holy love of God and it cannot be defeated. <laughs> Nails cannot destroy it. Taunting cannot weaken it. Hatred cannot overcome it. Amen. This is what we mean by love. Holy love. Okay? So the church, the church has work to do here. The church has work to do here in Europe. The church has work to do here in North America. That we need to think critically. We need not, we must not be naive. Oh yeah, they're talking about love. Uh, and, and, and we're talking about love. Oh, they're the, we're the same. They're the same things. Oh, maybe not. Maybe not. Okay? Uh, so, the third mark of the new birth is holy love. The love of God, the love of God who transcends us in beauty, in power, in glory. Uh, we love God as the end, as the goal of our lives, the perfection of our being. We love God and we love our neighbor. We love our neighbor. We love our neighbor as ourselves. And this holy love is a love which is obedient, which obeys the commandments of Jesus Christ, that is faithful, that wants to be faithful, that wants to love Christ and to walk in the path of the obedience of faith that the book of Hebrews talks about. Okay, uh, And so uh, this is um, uh, an important love, an important love. Now, uh, I'm going to take a pause, if you will, uh, to help you out uh, and to describe a kind of trajectory of the Christian life uh, that may be helpful to you in your own reflections, in your own reflections about uh, the process, the transition from a person who is a sinner to someone uh, who is justified and born of God and therefore marked by all three of the marks of the new birth, which are the theological virtues of faith, uh, hope, uh, and, and love. Okay? And love, of course, is the end. It's the goal. It's the telos. There is a sense where, and scripture even talks about this, faith will pass away. Because then we will have knowledge. We will see God face to face. But love will never pass away. Holy love will never pass away. And so we know that it is the end or goal, the end or goal towards which we are headed. Now what I want to talk about is just, it's actually Wesley's sermon, The Spirit of Bondage and of Adoption. And he has a typology in that sermon and I want you to be aware of that typology because it's a useful way of thinking about the Christian journey, of thinking about Christian discipleship. And so the first state that Wesley talks about here is the natural state, the natural state. Uh, let me say right away that we talked about the natural person before. Remember that? The natural person in the context of original sin. And we said such a person doesn't actually exist because everybody has some measure of the grace of God. Okay? So don't confuse what I'm saying here. In other words, how Wesley is using the natural state in the context of this sermon with how Wesley talked about the natural state or condition in the context of original sin, because they're very different. And sometimes people confuse them, and then you'll just make great confusion. You must understand context, okay? 
This is in a different context. Because why? Because the natural state that I'm going to describe now, there are many people uh, in the natural state, billions of people in the natural state. Uh, uh, in other words, it's not a kind of theoretical construct uh, when we talk about the natural state in original sin, that there is no one actually who is apart from all the grace of God. Okay? You got that? We're in a different context here, so understand that. All right. So, what is the natural state? Um, it, it's quite clearly a state of sleep. These are people who are unawakened. They're unawakened. Have you ever encountered such people? I, I run into them all the time. They're dead spiritually. They, if you were to talk to them about life in the spirit, they wouldn't know what you meant. They, they, they can't compute. They, they can't understand what you mean uh, about life in the spirit. You being in the spirit and the spirit being in you. They, they wouldn't understand that. Uh, because they are <coughs> asleep. They're sleepers. They're not awake uh, to this reality. Do these people exist? Yes. <laughs> there, there are millions upon millions and billions of people like this. Their spiritual senses, their spiritual senses are, are not awake. The eyes of their understanding are closed. The eyes of their understanding are closed, Wesley writes. Uh, and here's what he says about these people. Uh, quote, he is secure because he is utterly ignorant of himself. Hence, he talks of repenting by and by. For all this time, he is the servant of sin. He is the servant of sin. He commits sin more or less day by day. Yet, he is not troubled. Not troubled. He sins up. It doesn't bother me. Doesn't bother me. He is in no bondage, as some speak. He feels no condemnation. You know, we were talking the other day about a rightly ordered conscience. Wesley continues to describe this person in a natural state. He sees not that he stands on the edge of the pit. Therefore, he fears it not. He fears it not. You cannot fear what you do not know. Okay? That's another way of saying it. And Wesley does say that because he finishes the quote by saying, he cannot tremble at the danger he does not know. So if we talk about the natural state in this context, the natural state, the principal characteristic here is ignorance. Ignorance or you could even say sleep. They're not awake or they're dead to the things of God. Then Wesley writes in this sermon, I love this language, then by an awful, an awful, in the best sense of that term, an awful providence of God, the one in the natural state is terribly awakened. They are awakened uh, to their uh, condition uh, by the Spirit of God, perhaps through the Spirit and through the Word perhaps through the moral law. And then Wesley writes, here ends, here ends the delusive rest. Here ends the false peace and the vain security. They now have, what do they have now? Sorrow of heart. They have sorrow of heart. Uh, they now acknowledge God. They are beginning to discern spiritual things. However, they do not love God, they fear God. They fear God, and they fear death. They fear death as well. And so Wesley writes of the person in, and the second stage, the second state is called the legal. The legal state, the legal state. And Wesley writes here, quote, one is terribly shaken out of his sleep and awakes into the consciousness of his, of his danger, okay? And so a person in the legal state, they begin to understand the things of God, the inward spiritual meaning of the law of God now begins to glare upon them. They begin to understand that. 
they now feel the chains, the chains of sin. They realize that in various ways they are and have been in bondage, but they can find no release. They sin, repent, and sin again. Okay? Uh, and they are sinning unwillingly. Like Paul describes in Romans 7, they are doing the very thing they hate, but yet they do it. They do it. And their conscience is bothered. Their conscience is panged. Uh, and so Wesley <coughs> describes this person in the legal state as repenting and sinning, as sinning unwillingly, as repenting and sinning yet again. He describes this person as under the law. They are under the law. And the principal characteristic here is what? What's the one word principal characteristic here? Fear. Fear. So the first one was ignorance. The second one is fear. Okay? These, these folk, they recognize God, but they fear God. And then the last stage is the evangelical. The evangelical state, uh, and here Wesley writes, the bondage ends. The bondage ends, that they become a child of God, that they have the spirit of adoption. They have the spirit of adoption whereby they cry, Abba, Father. They are no longer under law, but under grace. Their eyes are open. Just as, you know, the eyes were open in the legal state, but now they see not a God of wrath, but a God of love. Um, they do not fear this God, certainly not in a fear that has torment, but they do have fear in terms of respect, the fear of God in that sense. But they love God. They love God. They love God now. They, their eyes are open to see a loving and gracious God they love God. Uh, their bondage unto fear is gone. Because, see, that's what this sermon is about. The spirit of bondage, okay? The spirit of bondage um, and then the spirit of adoption. It's that transition. The legal state is a spiritual a spirit of bondage. Uh, and the evangelical state uh, is a spirit of adoption whereby we become the children of God and we love God uh, and we know that God loves us. We know, in other words, that we are the beloved. We are the beloved. We are the beloved. So, what's the principal characteristic here? We talked about ignorance in terms of the natural state. We talked about fear in terms of the legal state. Uh, in terms of the evangelical state, what's the one word, or maybe two Law. words? Law. What? Law. Right. Holy love. You get an A. <laughs> holy love. Or love, but we're going to be more careful, especially in today's context. Holy love, because that's what Wesley means for sure. Uh, so this is the principle. So in a real sense, you know, if you want a typology, what does the entire process of salvation look like? It is a process moving from ignorance of the things of God through fear, you know, a lot of fear and guilt and condemnation and anxiety and all that onto peace and serenity and love, knowing that we are the beloved, that Christ died for me. Even me, and save me from the law of sin and death. So, this is a, a very helpful typology for you. Uh, it's a part of Wesley's theology. It's another tool you can use uh, to think through to think through uh, his theology. Um, now, um, I also want to take a look at. Um, uh, this whole area and, and Wesley's under, uh, understanding of holiness because he puts such a strong emphasis on this. Um, and I want to take a look at um, a couple of sermons whereby Wesley is going to underscore 
the importance of holiness, or as we were saying yesterday, sanctification, initial sanctification, this sort of thing. So, Wesley writes a sermon, The End of Christ's Coming, and no surprise, he's still thinking about what's real religion or what's true Christianity, and he writes this in thinking about what's real religion. Quote, it is a restoration of man by him that bruises the serpent's head to all that the old serpent deprived him of. It is a restoration not only to the favor, but likewise to the image of God, implying not barely a deliverance from sin, but the being filled with the fullness of God. And so here we see a participatory theme. These are the themes of sanctification that we actually really become holy in our lives, okay? And so Wesley uh, is going to underscore not simply justification and the forgiveness of sins, but also the doctrine of sanctification that we must actually be holy. We must actually be holy. And so, um, you know, I'm going to make a quote from a sermon uh, called The Wedding Garment. And, um, you know, I published recently, a, a couple of years ago, a copy, uh, a, a, an edition of Wesley's sermons called The Sermons of John Wesley, a collection for the Christian journey. And I have 60 sermons there. And they were all arranged in the, in the order of salvation. But if I were to include 61, in other words, if I had one more choice of sermons to include, because Wesley wrote 151 sermons, if I had one more choice, it would be this sermon, the wedding garment. Why? Well, think of the image from the New Testament context. What is the wedding garment? That person needed the wedding garment to be at the wedding feast, and those who didn't have the garment were what? They were cast out. They were cast out. What is the wedding garment? See, that's the issue that Wesley's going to raise in this sermon, uh, the wedding garment. So he writes this, quote, Indeed, some have supposed that when I began to declare, by grace you are saved through faith. In other words, talking about justification, the forgiveness of sins. I retracted what I had before maintained without Holiness, no man shall see the Lord. By faith we are saved from sin and made holy. We're made holy. The imagination that faith supersedes holiness is the marrow of antinomianism. So what's Wesley saying there, especially in that last line? There were some people, even Protestants in the 18th century, who had so magnified justification by grace through faith that they forgot about holiness. They forgot that just as we are you know, justified by grace through faith, we receive the new birth, that transformation of being into holiness by grace through faith. And then, and then Wesley wrote in his sermon on God's vineyard, here he's talking about the different theological traditions. We had this question earlier. How do the different theological traditions view things? And watch this. Watch what Wesley's going to do. Quote, many who have spoken and written admirably concerning justification had no clear conception, nay, were totally ignorant of the doctrine of sanctification. Okay, so he's saying, all right, there are some people who really understand justification, but they don't understand sanctification. So then he continues, he's naming names. See, he's naming names now. I'm using his exact language. This is not correct English today, but here's what he writes. Quote, who has wrote more ably than Martin Luther on justification by faith alone, and who was more ignorant of the doctrine of sanctification or more confused in his conceptions of it. Then Wesley looks at another theological tradition. He says, on the other hand, how many writers of the Romish church, and by this, of course, he means Roman Catholicism, 
how many writers of the Romish church have wrote strongly and scripturally on sanctification who nevertheless were entirely unacquainted with the nature of justification, okay? So Wesley here is being critical of Protestants. He's being critical of Roman Catholics. And then in, in maybe some Methodist triumphalism, uh, Wesley writes, ah, but it has pleased God to give the Methodists a full and clear knowledge of each. In other words, a proper understanding of justification and a proper understanding of sanctification. Okay, uh, and so we we see this uh, uh, quite quite clearly. Um, so uh, Wesley uh, underscores underscores the importance of holiness. Um, he did this uh, in a number of writings. Uh, he realized in the 18th century that people were. Uh, teaching a gospel that did not embrace holiness, that left people in their sins. He calls this antinomianism. Uh, and so what are some of the things that Wesley writes uh, along this line to emphasize this? He writes a dialogue, listen to the title, a dialogue between an antinomian and his friend. A dialogue between an antinomian and his friend and once wasn't enough because he writes a second dialogue between an antinomian and his friend. Then he writes the sermon that we just talked about, which underscores holiness, the wedding garment, the wedding garment. Uh, he wrote thoughts on the imputed righteousness of Christ. I'll say a little bit about that at this point. I, I can't go into it in great detail for the sake of time. But if you look at Wesley's sermon, The Lord, Our Righteousness, he does have a doctrine of imputation. Uh, and it's, it's related principally to the issue of justification and forensic themes that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, the sinner, so that we may be justified. But when Wesley's in the area of sanctification, he doesn't talk about imputation, but impartation meaning that we actually really become holy. We actually really become holy. So there's the difference between imputation, impartation. Imputation largely related to justification and forensic themes. Impartation related to sanctification participatory themes, okay? Uh, because Wesley's going to underscore, we must be actually holy uh, because the Holy Spirit is in us transforming our being. Okay? Uh, and then Wesley wrote uh, a very pungent piece. Wesley could do this. Listen to this title. Wow, this is amazing. Um, a blow at the root. A blow at the root. Think of chopping a tree down. You would go to the root of the tree a blow at the root, or Christ stabbed in the house of his friends. Now that's a title of an essay. <laughs> you can see it's very pungent. A blow at the root, or Christ stabbed in the house of his friends. Uh, who's doing the stabbing? Christ is being stabbed. Who is doing the stabbing? Who? You're going to learn something about Wesley now. Who's, who's, doing, who's stabbing Christ? in this title. Christ stabbed in the house of his friends. The church, the church, the church is stabbing Christ. How are they stabbing Christ? Because they are teaching against holiness. They are teaching against holiness. And so in that treatise, uh, a blow at the root or Christ stabbed in the house of his friends, you're going to see many instances Many instances where Wesley underscores, where Wesley underscores holiness. All right, we have time for a few questions here.
Questions, comments? Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm still going here. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Мне интересно, как практически в личной жизни ценности Весли отображались. Ценности Весли, то есть его принципы, святости, ну все, что он писал, его тело. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, you know, I've spent many, many years studying the life and thought of John Wesley, and I do believe that he practiced what he preached, and I do believe uh, that John Wesley lived a holy life. He, he, in other words, he knew the very realities of which he was preaching and teaching. And I would go even further than that, and I know I'm getting into some controversial territory here, but I would argue that um, before John Wesley died, uh, he was entirely sanctified. Um, now, he doesn't refer to that specifically in any one place in his writings, okay? Uh, so, you know, it's not a matter, but, but then that's Wesley. He, he doesn't say, me, me, look at me, you know, it's about me. He doesn't do that sort of thing. Uh, and it's in a quite other context. He wouldn't have had the time to write these down because I think if you take a serious and careful look and pay attention to all the details now of Wesley, John Wesley on his deathbed, John Wesley on his deathbed, surrounded by his friends, okay? Pay attention to how Wesley is dying. He knows he's dying. He knows he will soon be with the Lord. Pay attention to what he's saying. Pay attention to the hymns from Isaac Watts that he is reciting. For example, I'll praise my maker while I breath. I'll praise, I'll praise. John Wesley is on his deathbed. He is dying. He is in utter serenity, utter serenity and peace, knowing he will see God face to face. And his uh, response is, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll praise, I'll praise, I'll praise my maker while I breath. Now, you know, what I've just told you is not going to satisfy some people. They're going to say, well, you know, Don, John Wesley didn't, you know, sit up and say, I've been entirely sanctified on this date, blah, 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 blah. The evidence is all around you. It's all around you if you have the eyes to see it. Uh, this is precisely uh, uh, the consequences of what a pure heart would look like. In other words, that kind of rich serenity, that kind of deep love, that kind of uh, full-bodied assurance, uh, knowing that one is going to meet one's maker shortly, you see? I, I think, and I, I've actually thought about writing this up, and I should, <laughs> I should, uh, because it's all in my mind, and I've looked at the evidence, and it's all there. I see it. It's like, it's like going to an art gallery and looking at a painting, and then... You know, you see uh, from the whole composition, you finally discern the total effect, and it's in the same way. Uh, now, there are certainly those people in Wesley's studies who, unless they have a statement from John Wesley saying, I was entirely <coughs> sanctified on this date at this time, blah, 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 they won't be satisfied, but uh, I, I have no desire to please them. I don't. I don't.